how many of you have been getting some good things out of these messages that pastor's been preaching on the Holy Spirit? Amen. Amen. Good stuff. And I'm um, going to try to, to branch off of that, build off of that a little bit this morning. And uh, we know that the Holy Spirit ministers to us in many, many ways. Uh, he ministers to us individually, uh, and he also ministers to us corporately uh, as a spiritual community. And so that's what I'm going to try to build off of that and we rely upon the Holy Spirit and we cooperate with Him to build an atmosphere, uh, a spiritual climate where, where He can move, where He can speak, where He can touch the lives of people. And we want to see signs and, and wonders. Amen? We want to see miracles. We want to see uh, manifestations uh, of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to be talking this morning about the power of the testimony. And we know that it, an anointed testimony helps the Spirit of God create momentum. We want to have spiritual momentum as we enjoy the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It propels us forward. So this morning... Before I really get into my message, well, I guess the first part of my message is we're going we're gonna to broaden our thinking. We're going to expand the definition of the testimony. Because many times we hear the word testimony, and not always, but many times we associate with that word uh, the story of our personal salvation. And it certainly is that, but we're going to expand it. And so if we can put that up, the definition of this up, the, the, we're going to expand it. We're going to make it bigger. And this is our testimony. This is a quote from a man named Bill Johnson. And this is how he's defining testimony. Remembering and declaring what God has said and done in our lives and in the lives of others. Isn't that powerful? Remembering and declaring what God has said and done in our lives and in the lives of others. Now, this, this doesn't diminish in any way the importance of your personal story, uh, of how you came to faith, of what God has done in your life. And uh, there's, there's many preachers and teachers that encourage us to, to really dial that in. You know, you may only have an elevator ride to share your story of faith. And uh, it's important that we, we dial that in and be able to share that in a, in a short space of time. We never really know uh, what we'll have. So fine-tune your personal story uh, to share with people because people need to hear it, okay? But um, for the purposes of this message, this is the working definition of the testimony. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. And that's one of the things that the Holy Spirit does. He reminds us of what God has done. He reminds us of God's promises. And when we, when we learn how to harness that and flow with it, it creates faith. It creates momentum. And it creates an atmosphere and a culture that the Spirit of God can move. We've talked about this before. A, a culture where the Holy Spirit can move. You know, there's, there's culture in places of business. Families have cultures. Churches have cultures, right? And we talked about the fact that a culture a few months back when you have a group of people, a gathering of people, you have attitudes, you have uh, values, you have expectations spoken and unspoken, what's accepted, what's expected. And so there's this collective attitude that we want to have as a people who love the presence of God 
we pursue the presence of God, and we want the Holy Spirit to do anything that He wants to do in our midst. And it propels, and it gets better and better. That's, that's what we're after. So we're going to talk about how we harness the power of the testimony. We've redefined testimony. How do we harness the power of that testimony to, to move into that deeper and deeper as the family of God? Amen? All right. How do we harness the power of the testimony? So the first point, in order to harness the power of the testimony, we have to be able to receive it. I want to read a verse from John 16, 13 through 15. This is Jesus speaking. He says, but when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but he will speak whatever he hears, and he will tell you of things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will receive from me and will declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he, the Holy Spirit, will take what is mine and will declare it to you. Now, here's another verse. I don't believe that this is in your notes, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, Paul builds off of this theme, and Paul says this. He says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, so that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. Say that word with that, that phrase, freely given. Why did we receive the Holy Spirit, Paul? Well, so that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. And now, we, we just have to understand and appreciate what an amazing promise this is. That there are things in the heart of God Deep secrets, deep truths, realities. There's, there's all these things in the heart of God. And he has released the Holy Spirit into the earth. And those things are not hidden from us. They are things that are hidden for us. But we have to cooperate. And just because it has been freely given, it also has to be received. It's been freely given, and you have to receive it. Now, that seems like a no-brainer, but for many, it's not. I also think that this, uh, well, this next passage I know is not in your notes. You know, I, I gave Diane the outline, and then yesterday, the Holy Spirit added some things to it. So, just, we'll just bear with it. So, if you have a Bible, turn to Matthew 9. Matthew 9, verses 1 through 8. Now, this, this dynamic that we're going to look at in this passage of Scripture is something that is repeated over and over and over throughout the Gospels. And this was just a great example of it. And, and as you read the Gospels, you'll see this. Matthew 9, 1 through 8. Now, when we read this, this is the thing I want you to look for. There's the miracle or miracles that happen and then there's the different ways that people respond to the miracle. That's what we're going to look for, is the response that people have. And I'm just going to read this to you for mine. It says, Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. He entered a boat and crossed over and came into his own city. And they brought to him a man sick with paralysis lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Then certain scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, arise, pick up your bed, and go into your house. And he rose and departed to his house. But when the crowds saw it, they were amazed and glorified God who had given such authority to men. Now, 
it's interesting because a little bit later on in this chapter, we see another set of miracles that Jesus does, and we see different reactions. We find throughout the Gospels, when Jesus ministered and the power of God flowed and lives were changed, bodies were healed, people were set free, you've got people that rejoiced. They responded with, with shouts of praise and amazement and, oh, isn't God wonderful? And then you have people that were skeptical. They were jealous. They were offended, and just some of it was plain old unbelief. You know, a few verses later is the story of where Jesus delivers the man with the deaf and dumb spirit. And then, of course, there were some Pharisees there. I mean, there's this huge crowd of people. Everybody sees the same miracle. Some respond with amazement and excitement about what God is doing, and someone else says, ah, he casts out devils by the Spirit. He casts out demons by the king of demons. Different reactions. Some people just don't get it. They just don't get it. So this is the, this is the application. This is just what I said earlier. Here's this amazing demonstration of the power of God. Everybody sees the same miracle. Some received the miracle. And they talked about it. There's many places in the New Testament, or excuse me, in the Gospels, where it says, and the fame of Jesus spread. The, 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 the reputation of Jesus spread. How was that happening? It was the power of the testimony of the people that had seen it. And it created a momentum. It created a spirit of faith. But not everyone received it. The gift has to be, the gift that's been f given freely must be received. And so, how does this apply to you? Well, guess what? The testimonies of God, they have to find a place in you. They have to take root in you. The Holy Spirit wants to impart some things to you and you have to receive it. The gift has been given. God has fulfilled his responsibility. God has fulfilled his promise, but you have to receive it. So that's the first step of harnessing the power of the testimony is we have got to receive it. I need to move on. Number two, after we receive it, we have to remember it. We have to remember it. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house. When you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Wow. Let's just get the word of God everywhere, right? Keep it in front of our face. And, you know, you read that and you'd think, why is all, I mean, come on, is all that really necessary? Doesn't that seem like that's a little bit over the top of just keeping the word of God everywhere? And I believe that God, he is, he is compensating for our tendency to forget. We have a tendency to forget these things. You know, the disciples they're in the boat with Jesus, right? They witness these miracles, the, 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 the feeding of the 5,000. And then they're in the boat and they forget. You know, oh no, we don't have bread. And you know, Jesus scolds them. I think that he was expecting a little bit more from them in terms of their ability to remember what God had done and have faith for what God 
You know, God met this incredible need, and you know what? He's, he's faithful. He's going to meet the needs that we have. And he recognizes, God just, he, he recognizes these tendencies that we have. Now look at uh, just a few verses, a couple chapters later on, Deuteronomy chapter 8, 10 through 15. He kind of expands on this theme a little bit more, and he says this. I'm starting at verse 10, chapter 8 of Deuteronomy. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I'm commanding you today. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are full and have built and occupied good houses, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold multiply, and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud. And you'll forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. I'm going to jump down to verse 18. It says, but you must remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you the ability to get wealth so that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, then I testify against you today that you'll surely perish. Just like the nations which the Lord will destroy before you, so shall you perish because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. Now, many people, when things are going tough, when they're having a hard time, they struggle to remain faithful to the Lord. But God identifies that the tendency of many, many people is they struggle to serve God and stay faithful to God when things are going good. They've lost their faith in God, and there's been a slow transfer of faith to their own abilities, to their own resources. So if you think it's a challenge to serve God when things are going bad, it's a challenge to serve God when things are going good according to the Word of God. And God sees a connection between forgetting the goodness of the Lord and then the entrance, the slow deterioration of our heart toward pride, rebellion, idolatry, when the remembrance of God's goodness departs and we lose our gratitude you know what, there's a vacuum in our heart that's going to be filled with something. Something is going to occupy that place. You know, another story further on, Joshua chapter 4, remember they crossed the Jordan River. And as soon as they get across the river, they erect a pile of stones. And the purpose of those stones was when you're walking by and you see the stones and your children ask you what those things are about. What's, what's up with the pile of stones? Again, it's a device to remember the goodness of the Lord. Remember the goodness of the Lord. Stones of remembrance. Stones of remembrance. So let me ask you something. If you've seen the faithfulness of God in your life, now if you've not seen faithfulness in, of God, then don't worry about it. But if you've seen the blessing of the Lord, do you have a system, do you have something in place that will help you keep that in front of you all the time? Because the Word says, we forget. Isn't it amazing God's understanding of human nature? How does he know these things about us? Do you have stones of remembrance? Do you have something where you can faithfully, intentionally remember the goodness of God and all his many ways that he's blessed us? I remember uh, when we had a, a home group in our in our home, and uh, we would journal. I hope that every small group is doing this where you've got some type of a journal, and as, as you pray about things as a small group, you're writing down what you're praying about, and you're writing down the answers. And we had collected these for a couple years, and, you know, one day Diane and I sat down and went through that. 
and realize, oh yeah, that's right. We prayed about that marriage. God restored that marriage. We prayed for that person to get a job. God brought them a job. We prayed about that physical problem that that person had, and God healed them. I mean, testimony after testimony, you know, that was really encouraging. And when those things happened, we rejoiced as a group. We just thought that, that was so incredible. But you know, time went on, and it took us to go through that book and remember all of those ways that God had answered prayer. Because why? Our tendency is to forget. I believe some, you know, you just... We can all be more intentional about this. Step two of harnessing the testimony is not only receiving, but remembering. Being intentional about remembering. Number three, number three. Declare, declare it. You know, with these four points, a clever preacher would have found a way to make them all the same, start with all the same letter, but... Oh, well. Next sermon, we'll try, to, we'll try to make that work. Okay. Declare it. We have to declare it. It's got, it, you know, sooner or later, your mouth's got to get involved, right? Sooner or later, it's, it's got to get into what's coming out of your mouth, right? So Joshua 1, 8 through 9, and God outlines for Joshua the pattern of success. It says, this book of the law must not depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may act carefully according to all that's written in it. For then you will make your way successful and you'll be wise. Have not I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So he instructs, he instructs Joshua about not letting the Word of God depart from his mouth. Now, sometimes we can learn things by contrast. When we put two things side by side that are opposite and we compare the two, it helps us uh, learn the lesson. Uh, Jesus did this. He taught many powerful spiritual truths by simply comparing two things that were not alike. So the power of contrast is huge, and that's what I want to do. The first uh, testimony that we would look at is in, cha in John chapter 4, the woman at the well, right? Jesus meets this woman, and, um, you know, Bible scholars have made note of the fact that she's, she's going to get water in the middle of the day. Women didn't go to the well in the middle of the day. They went together in the cool of the morning. And so she was by herself for a reason. And, you know, I'm not going to go into all the details of that story. Uh, I would encourage you, uh, with this outline and every outline that you get, uh, you know, take, take these home and study these out. Read these verses for yourself. But she's there by herself. She encounters Jesus, and she goes back to that city with a testimony. John 4, 28. This is kind of the one little part that boils it down. It says, the woman then left her water pot. She went her way into the city, and she said to the men, come, see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they went out of the city and came to him. Now, there must have been an incredible anointing on this testimony because I don't think these people liked her very much. I don't think that they respected her very much. And the power of God on that testimony was so powerful that they were able to get past all of that and go out and hear Jesus. Now, here's going to teach you a new word, okay? She wasn't just evangelistic. She went back into town, and she was evangelistic. <laughs> Boom! Evangelistic. Now, I'll show you my notes later. All right, evangelistic. So now, wait a minute. Now, so, so this testimony opens up this whole city to the gospel. Now, if we go to Numbers 13 and 14. Again, won't go into all the details. Moses send 12, sends 12 spies into the promised land. Ten of those 12 
come back with an evil report. So maybe that's the opposite of a testimony is an evil report. Instead of being filled with faith, it's filled with doubt and unbelief. And so we can contrast the, the, the power that words have over a group of individuals, right? The woman at the well goes back and releases faith and salvation and deliverance. You know, the, the ministry of Jesus, you know what? They invited Jesus to stay, and guess what? He stayed for a couple of days. Now, there's a couple of places in the Bible where Jesus was told to go, and you know what? He left. He'll stay where he's invited, and he'll leave if he's told to leave. Anyway, that's, that's another sermon for another time. So listen, a good testimony released salvation to an entire city. An evil report cost an entire nation, an entire generation, their inheritance. Do not ever make the mistake to think that your words are neutral. Your words are not neutral. We need to think about what kinds of things we are releasing over our church, over our children, over our health, over our finances, on and on and on and on. We have to declare it. And we have to understand the power. If we're going to harness the power of the testimony, we have to understand the power of our words. Last thing. We've received it. We've remembered it. We've declared it. And now we have to protect it. We have to protect it. Let me read some verses from Judges chapter 2. 7. Then 10 through 12, it says, So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works that the Lord had done for Israel. That entire generation passed away, verse 10. And after them grew up a generation who did not know the Lord or the deeds that he had done for Israel. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. They abandoned the Lord God of their fathers who brought them out of the land of Egypt and they followed after other gods and the gods of the peoples around them. So what happened? The warning of Deuteronomy 11 came to pass. The testimony was lost. And it probably wasn't an intentional thing. There are things that deteriorate in our life not out of us being intentional, it's just they're neglected. They're not kept in the place of prominence. They're not, they're not intentionally remembered and communicated and passed on. It's very, very difficult to pass on radical commitment, radical obedience, radical pursuit of the things of God to a generation that's never seen the power of God. We just... They've not seen it. We, we protect and we preserve the power of the testimony when we pass it on to the next generation. Because what we want is we want the testimony of the things of God. We want that to gain momentum. We've heard that expression. We want our ceiling to be our children's floor, right? Revivals are not meant to die out. They're not meant to die out. They're not meant to come and go. The things of God in my life, I want to pass on to my children. I want them to take the baton and I want to carry that. I want them to go places in the spirit that I've never been. I believe that's God's will. So, what are the challenges? What are the challenges to build a culture of testimony? I, I believe that there are some challenges, and I think we need to talk about them. We need to get them out in the open. When we hear of somebody else's breakthrough in an area where we are struggling, that could be the area of our health, our, our finances, our marriage, our prodigal kids, 
somebody shares a testimony of provision or breakthrough or a miracle, and that is an area where you're still contending. You haven't seen your breakthrough yet. Can you rejoice with that person for their breakthrough when you're still waiting for yours? You know, an indicator of our spiritual health, one indicator of our spiritual health is this. Can we hear about another person's breakthrough? And then ask ourselves or discuss among people whether they deserved that breakthrough or not. Or be jealous of that breakthrough rather than rejoice with them can we tell ourselves that that was our breakthrough, that we deserved it more than them? Come on, I, need, I, I want us to be real about this because I know that people struggle with these kinds of things. There's two great obstacles that we're going to face as we build a culture of testimony. is unbelief and offense. Often Christians get offended at God. They get angry at God because they're praying for something that either God hasn't done or God hasn't done it yet or people get angry at God. Has anyone else ever spent any time of their life being angry at God? Yeah. Yeah. We, I'm almost done, we have the power and I believe the responsibility to choose the point of focus, okay? Are we going to focus on what God has done or are we going to focus on what God has not done? I think many times people pray for things. They believe God for things. Time goes by. The manifestation does not come quickly and there's a subtle shift of focus. And be people become angry and bitter at God over what God has not done. We have the power and the responsibility to choose. And if we, listen, listen, if we choose to focus on what God has done rather than what, not what God has done, then that gives us the grace to deal with the things that we do not understand. Right now, we're dealing with something that we do not understand. I have a choice to focus on what God is doing. God will give us grace to deal with the things that we don't have answers for. This last quote from Bill. Keeping the testimony is at the heart of our spiritual health. In the same way that we feed, clothe, and exercise our bodies, keeping the testimony is something that we must do as a lifestyle to keep us in a constant state of readiness, readiness to step into the next part of the lifelong assignment that God has for us. We receive it, we remember it, we declare it, and then we protect it. 